All right, well, thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, I'm super honored to be uh, selected to present for a group by, and I'm going to present my Life Hacks DBA Tools Edition session today. Uh, this is me, uh, Jess Pomford, if you haven't already heard, not related to the French, fi French fries. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm currently a database engineer uh, based in Southampton in England. I'm also an open source contributor. Uh, I've contributed to DBA tools, DBA checks, and I've written a couple of uh, resources for the SQL Server DSC module. Uh, I'm part of the reason that uh, I love to mention the open source stuff is that it was a big part in me getting my MVP, which I just uh, was awarded in February, which I'm super excited about, and basically means that I love to spend time talking to you all about SQL Server, PowerShell, automation stuff. I'm also passionate about SQL Server, PowerShell, and proper football. Uh, if you were with us just before this session, you will have heard me say that I am originally from England, but I spent uh, about 14 years in Ohio in the US. So there was some discussions on what proper football was and whether we should be using the wrong shaped ball in our hands rather than our feet. But anyway, it's better now I'm back in England, although there's no football for the, uh, for the virus. So maybe one day. My email address and my Twitter handle are on the slides. If you have any questions during or after the session, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I spend way too much time on Twitter, so you can probably find me there pretty easily. So this is the agenda for today's session. Uh, I'll give you a quick intro into what DBA Tools is if you haven't already heard about it. Uh, we'll do a quick PowerShell one-on-one -on -one so we can get set up and start using DBA Tools. And then I have six life hacks for you. Uh, I've broken them up into these uh, little chunks that you can take back and use in your environments immediately. So uh, we'll work through each one of those chunks and I'll stop for any questions as we work through them. So first up, what is DBA Tools? Uh, it's, it's easier in person to ask how many people have already heard of DBA Tools, but I'll just present, presume that most of you have heard of it uh, already. It is an open source PowerShell module. It's basically like a command line management studio. So where Management Studio is great for managing your instances, it's really, uh, I've just, let me just move this Zoom bar, sorry. Management Studio is really great for managing your instances, but it really only works one by one. Uh, you can control one database, you can control one login, uh, view the properties on one object. Uh, with DBA tools, we can take that power and then use it for multiple things. So we can use multiple we can change the settings on multiple databases at one time, on multiple logins. Uh, we can view the results of multiple jobs, for example. The module is MIT license, which is this short, uh, simple license that basically says if you keep the, uh, the, the copyright and licensing notices intact, you can pretty much use it for whatever you want. And there's more details on that on the GitHub uh, repo. DBA tools is also super secure. So PowerShell, the PowerShell team at Microsoft work by, on this secure by design approach. So the basis of DBA tools, which is PowerShell, is already pretty secure. Uh, DBA tools as a module is then uh, code signed, which means that the code that is put onto the PowerShell gallery, we'll talk about that and how we get the module from the PowerShell gallery in a second, but the code that is uh, taken from the GitHub repo is signed by a certificate uh, by one of two people and then placed on PowerShell Gallery. So when you download it, if that certificate is still intact, you know that the source code you have is the code that was put up onto the gallery. Uh, there are also over 500 tester tests in this module, which can uh, continually check that any changes made to the source code don't break existing functionality. Uh, that's really important as so many people are contributing, we don't wanna break anything that people are already using. So those tester tests, test the functionality and make sure things are still working as expected. Uh, the DBA tools team also use branch policies on GitHub. So the master branch, which is what is actually published to the PowerShell gallery is really locked down. And only a few members can actually merge code into the master branch that will then become production. They then have the dev branch, which most people will work against. You'll contribute your changes to the dev branch and it'll be code reviewed before it's merged into that branch. So there are multiple levels of kind of code review and checks and approvals before the code actually makes it into the master branch and is into production. One more thing I wanted to mention on this slide is that uh, DBA Tools was actually awarded the uh, Git Grant program, or sorry, the Git Grant 
recipient for 2020. This was just announced a couple of weeks ago um, by the DevOps Collective and PowerShell.org, which basically recognizes DBA tools as, as a great uh, open source product for the year. So that's pretty cool. So a quick history about DBA tools. It really started in 2014. Uh, Chrissy Lemaire created this giant PowerShell script uh, because she was trying to migrate SharePoint instances. And if you know anything about SharePoint on SQL Server, under the covers, there are tons of databases, there are tons of logins, there are jobs, there could be linked servers. There are all these pieces that go into a, a SharePoint instance on SQL Server. So when she was working on migrating them, she created this big script that goes through and moves every piece. In 2015, she was convinced to move it to GitHub as a module. Some people said, hey, this would be really useful. I could use this in my job too. Maybe not for SharePoint, but for migrating different applications. So in 2015 was the first commit to GitHub when it became the DBA tools module. And it then took about four years to June 2019 to be actually launched as a 1.0, which is like the first major software release. Um, at that point, it had 160 contributors and 550 commands. And the reason it took so long for, for it to get to 1.0 is Christy and the team really wanted to make sure that it was a solid product. There was standardized naming, so you knew what you were dealing with. The parameters had standard names, and there was all these pester tests which ensured the functionality. Uh, I just updated this slide this morning. We're now at version 1.0.108, so there's been 108 releases since last June, and we're up to 579 functions uh, and 590 pester tests, which is, I like to highlight that just because it gives us that guarantee that when we're contributing code and when we're using this module that it's, uh, it's doing what we expect and these changes aren't gonna break any existing functionality. Uh, there's also a book that you can get if you're interested in learning more about DBA tools. It's actually as part of the Manning Early Access Program uh, right now, which is MEEP. And I have this, uh, the link in my slides, which are available on my GitHub, but I will publicize also. Um, if you're interested in, in checking that out, eight of the 26 chapters are already available and they're all really great. Uh, so that's another great way of learning more about DBA tools and how you can, lose it, how you can use it in your environment. So hopefully you weren't, weren't looking forward to a whole hour of amazing slides because that's the end of my slides for now. Uh, this is the link where you can find my demos. They're on my GitHub. Uh, my username there is just jpomfret uh, and there's a demos repo uh, where you can download all of the code and files you need to run these demos. Let me switch over to VS Code. If you can't see VS co Code, someone should let me know. But uh, All good. Okay. So section one, this is my introduction to uh, DBA tools and PowerShell, how we can get the module and get started, and then we'll talk a little bit about splatting at the end here. So first of all, to get the module, as I mentioned, it's on the PowerShell gallery. If you're using a newer version of PowerShell, you can run install dash module DBA tools and it will install it automatically into your modules folder on your machine. If you need to use the module on a machine that is not connected to the internet, so you can't get to the PowerShell gallery, you can instead use save dash module. Uh, give it the module name of DBA tools and then a path C dash temp or C colon temp in this example. And it'll basically download that module into this folder and we can copy it out to the servers we need to use it on. If we're able to connect to the internet, we can then use update dash module to update our copy of DBA tools. Uh, Chrissy and the team release new versions almost every day. Uh, so it's good to keep up to date and uh, you can use update dash module to do that. Once we have the module installed on our machine, we'll want to import it into our session. I can use import dash module DBA tools to just import that into my current PowerShell session. And if I then run get dash module for DBA tools, you can see that I've imported the version of 1.0.1.8, 108, sorry. Uh, so that is the version that is currently in my session. I can also use the dash list available parameter to list all available DBA tool versions on my machine. You can see that I have the 107 version and I have some, some older versions that should probably be cleaned up. This is the uh, directory that it found the modules in. If I have more than one directory in my module path, it will look in all of those to find uh, the most, or to find the modules available. 
So now that we have the module imported into our session, we can use get dash command and module DBA tools to check out all the modules, all the commands. Now you can see there are a lot in this module. They're scrolling by. I told you there was like 590 uh, when we looked at them before. But I just wanted to show you this get dash command. That is a PowerShell uh, commandlet. You can use that for any module and you can use it to find what you need, the commands you need to do what you want to do. So for example, if I need to do something with SQL Server and, and compression, I can say get dash command. I'm passing in this pattern of compression with two wildcards. And then the, I'm asking from the module DBA tools. And if I run that, you can see at the bottom here, uh, we've got three commands returned. We have a get DBA DB compression, a set, and a test. Those are all from this 1.0.108 version of the module that I have imported. So get dash command is a PowerShell command. You can use that for any module. DBA tools also has a bonus command that they wrote called find DBA command. And if I pass compression into that, you will see that I get more commands returned. And the reason for this is find DBA command looks through all of the command, all of the comment based help uh, and finds the word compression. So you can see it return backup DBA database. That's because one of the parameters on this command is to use backup compression when you backup your database. So this is a good way of finding commands that might not be named exactly with the keyword you're looking for. There are some other parameters you can use, uh, like find DBA command with the author of Pomfret. So these four commands are commands that I started. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is not like, oh, cool, awesome, I wrote these commands. It's because I started these commands. So I had a specific use case for backing up and restoring uh, database certificates. So I wrote the uh, basic outline of what I needed and it did just that. It backed them up and it restored them. Since then, when I, when I contributed these functions, which was a couple of years ago now, other people have come along and added more and more use cases for them. So these commands are much more full and valuable than when I contributed them. And this is really the power of using an open source module instead of using the commands that you write yourself, right? because I'm using my knowledge plus everyone else's knowledge to use the best possible command. So that's one of my favorite things about DBA tools and why I love to co contribute some of the commands that I've written because I know people will take them and make them better and then I can use the better versions. So with PowerShell, as I said, it has that get dash command. It, it likes to teach you how to use it and you can use get dash help passing a command uh, and it'll give you all of the comment based help that was in that command. You can see you get a bit of a short description, you get some details on the syntax, and you get a long description. You can also use the, sh the uh, show window parameter and it'll pop up uh, this PowerShell window, which has all of the help in it with this handy search bar. So if I type database in here, you can see it's highlighted all of the database keywords in this help. The really nice thing about this is I can leave this window up while I go back to my PowerShell window and I can come back and, re and refer back to this help if I need it. So that's the show window parameter. That's really useful. All right, so finally for this section, I wanna talk about splatting. So this command I have here is get DBA DB compression. I pass in a SQL instance, a credential to connect to that instance, the database name, and then I'm selecting the first five objects. So all that is gonna do is get me the first five things that are, that are in this database and the compression uh, stats about them. It's showing me the indexes, whether they're compressed, how big they are. Once you start adding parameters like this, it's gonna quickly roll off the side of the screen and it's kind of hard to read. And the more you pipe and the more you add on to this, the longer it gets. So with splatting, we're just gonna use a different kind of format to, uh, to kind of display our code. What we have here is a hash table with the parameter names on the left and the values on the right that we can then pass in with this special, with the special syntax using the at parameter with the variable name to then pass those parameters into get DBA DB compression. So this right here is the exact same result as I just ran from this one line. It's just formatted uh, neater and easier to see on the screen. I'm not sure that actually ran. Okay having some problems with VS Code this weekend and it looks like it's still doing it. Uh, it's not pressing, F8 is not doing what I expect. But anyway, same results came through. This is just a different way of presenting it and it makes it uh, easier to view. 
and a little neater on the screen. So that is splatting. Most of my code and my demos will be set up this way. So just wanted to give you a heads up on how that looks and how that works. So that is the end of our introduction to PowerShell and DBA tools. I'm going to pause if there are any questions before we move on to the next life hack. So um, first of all, there's one comment from a bunch of us. We were, a bunch of us were pretty impressed how you snuck in your pronouns in your um, introduction slide. That was very <laughs> nice. Okay, so cool. Kudos for that. Thank um, you. But, but there is also one question. Um, will autocomplete work with that way? With the splatting? Um, it will not because the, uh, the hash table, it doesn't know that this hash table is going to go into that uh, command. So no, autocomplete does not work like this. If I'm going to, if I need to use autocomplete, I could come down here and start typing and it should pick it up. It's not going to behave right now, but uh, that's why I would recommend using that show window parameter to open up the help and you can grab the parameter names and examples and stuff from them. Okay. But and no. uh, one more question um, from Sean Carr is uh, what is Pester? Ah, good show. So Pester is a uh, PowerShell testing framework. Uh, it is used in the DBA, t DBA tools module to basically test that things are as expected. You would use it to uh, test your code. You can also use it to test your infrastructure uh, with DBA checks, which we'll mention later on. But basically it's saying, if I run get DBA DB compression, I can say I expect it to do these things and then I can test for it using Pesta. So that when I add code to that module and I or to that function and I break something, the pester test will break and I won't be able to merge that code in. So right. hopefully that's a decent explanation. Yeah, thank you very much. Otherwise, Eugene and I and myself, we are a bit bummed that we're not going to see PowerPoint slides for 60 minutes, but I guess there's ah. nothing we can do about that. So I guess um, it's yeah. better than us. Sad times. Maybe, maybe later we'll find a couple more. Oh, awesome. Thank you. All right, so that was the introduction. Let me get rid of this. We're going to move on to backup. So this is my first main life hack. Uh, we're going to look at how we can review our backup history with DBA tools. We'll actually back up our databases using it, and then we'll test our backups to make sure they're working. As you know, uh, as most DBAs would tell you right off the bat, the backups are useless if we can't actually restore them, right? So we're going to test that out, uh, and then we're going to save those results off to a table for us to use. So first of all, I'm looking at get DBA DB backup history. And if I, if I run this guy, uh, you can see that is not what we want to run. Let me grab this. Okay. We are passing in the SQL instance of MS SQL 1. So I'm just looking at one SQL instance and I'm asking about the backup history for that. You can see in the results down here and the results will start to look pretty familiar. We got a SQL instance, we have our database name, and I have taken a full backup, a differential backup, and a log backup. You can see some information on where they went, sizes, start, duration, etc. There's also a database admin database on that instance. Uh, so I can use backup DBA database, passing in the SQL instance and the database name. And if I run this, it will actually run the backup of that database. And since I haven't passed in where the backup should go, it's going to use the default backup uh, directory that's set up at the instance level. So you can see I got the same output, basically SQL instance, the database details on my backup. So now that both databases on my instance have had a full backup, at least I can test the backups. Uh, so test DBA last backup. Now this is a really great command that if, if you, a jot notes down, I would jot this one down and go back and look at it. It's basically going to allow me to offload testing my backups to a second server. So my SQL instance, MS SQL 1, is my source location for my databases. I've given it the database names of AdventureWorks and database admin, but I could leave that blank and it would test all of them. I'm giving it a destination of MS SQL 2, which is my second instance, uh, because I don't want to restore and test my backups in production. I want to offload that to a second server. I have verbose set to true. Uh, this is a switch parameter. Uh, so set to true, just so I can see more output. I'm kind of nosy and I like to know what's going on. And then the out variable parameter, I've passed in results. What that would do is the results that you see on the screen when I run this will also be saved into the results parameter uh, that we can use later on for uh, viewing them or saving them into a table. So I've kicked that off. The first thing it does is it goes and looks up the, the restore history that we've already looked at. <clears throat> it's looking to build an LSN chain. Uh, 
and it will build it as far as it can. So for the AdventureWorks database, we had a full backup, a differential backup, and a log backup. So it will take those, and as long as the LSN chain is intact, intact, it will restore all three of those files to our second server. It, it's now uh, running a check DBCC to check for any corruption on that second instance. And once it's completed that and got the result, it will drop that database uh, from the second instance. Once it's completed that for the first one, it moves on to the database admin database. Uh, and that one's pretty small, so it's finished that up. So all of the yellow text that might be kind of hard to see on the screen is the verbose output. And then the black text is the actual output uh, that is returned. So you get all of the details about the restore testing that happened, where it came from, where it was restored, the database name. You can see both my restore and my DBCC checks were successful, and then how long each of those pieces took. It also gives you the backup files that we use. So in this case, there was just a full backup for my database admin, oh sorry, for my AdventureWorks backup, you can see that there was a full backup, a differential backup, and a log backup applied. So that will be pretty useful to keep track of, right? So I can take, the results that I that I out use out variable to save those results, and I can pipe it to write DBA data table, and I'm telling it the SQL instance, the database, and the table name of where these results should live. I'm also using the auto create table. So when I run this, it'll actually create that table if it doesn't already exist, Oops. and save the data that was in the results variable into my table. So if I pop open uh, Azure Data Studio and I take a look at my AdventureWorks and database admin databases on this guy, I have a notebook connected to MS SQL 1. And if I look at the test restore table, you can see that I have all of the details that were returned in that output. I've got source server, test server, database name, how big those databases were, the status of the restore and the DBCC checks, so both successful, and how long those pieces took and the files used. So this is really valuable information that we can keep track of. And if someone comes and says, hey, the backup didn't work, I can say, well, it worked on this day. So we know we at least have a good backup on this day. And if we're per performing this pretty often, we'll find the backups that fail first before they're actually needed. We can also use piping to do this. So if I use test uh, DBA last backup, and I'm using the same parameters, this is the same splat that we used pr previously, and then piping it straight into write DBA data table, it'll put them into the same table. Uh, and so right now I'm testing the same backups, right? I didn't take any more backups in this demo. So I'm testing the same ones that we knew worked five seconds ago. So hopefully they still work now. But my point is that if you did this every day or every week with some different databases, you could start to build up a history of your restore testing that you could report on. You could also see trends in how long it takes to restore databases. If your database is pretty large and it's taking longer and longer to restore each time, you probably need to know about that and make sure that you can still restore it within your SLAs. So once this is finished and it goes through, as I said, uh, restore it, DBCC check, and then drop it once that's been successful. I can come in here and if I check that table again, you can see now I have four rows for the two instances uh, sorry, for so the two databases that we restored, tested twice, basically. So this is how to automate your testing of your backups with DBA tools. This is one of my favorite things to show because I think it could be valuable to most DBAs, and it's pretty easy to get it set up and, and saving the results off to a table. So I'll pause for a second if there are any questions about testing your backups or viewing backup history with DBA tools. So no questions so far, unless something pops in right away, but no, okay. seems good. So perfect. Cool stuff. Thank you. All right. Moving on to logins. So now we'll look at how we can manage logins and access with DBA tools. Uh, we'll add a login to the server. We're just going to use a SQL login, uh, but you can use AD logins or groups also. We'll add that user to the database, assign some permissions. Uh, we'll talk about how we can change passwords, and then we'll talk about the power of, of reading in a CSV to create multiple users at once. So first up, for a new DBA login, we can pass in a SQL instance, a login name. As I mentioned, this is just a SQL login named JSP, and a secure password. This is a uh, uh, secure string variable in PowerShell. So if I run this, it will create my login and return some information that 
it's basically been created and where. Now this is uh, just creating the user, sorry, just creating the login on the instance. It's not actually been associated with any databases or got any access at this point. So then we can use new DBA DB user for that JSP login. I can give it access to this database admin database. Now the first step is just to create the user in the database. So right now it would just have the public role. If I wanted to add it to the DB data reader role, I can use add DBA DB role member. Same kind of command, same kind of parameters like SQL instance, username, database, and the role. I've set confirm to false. Uh, if I didn't do that, it would basically prompt me and say, are you sure you want to add this user? And I could press yes or no if I wanted to back out of it. So now my JSP login has been added to the server as a SQL login. I've given it access to the database admin database. I just read access. I could also use add DBA server role member if I wanted to create a sysadmin or DB creator, that kind of role. I can then use set DBA login to change things about that login. So in this case, it's SQL login. At my previous job, we had to change SQL login passwords every year. Uh, so I could use something like this where I am asking, uh, the first line is read host. And it's basically saying enter the new password. I've got this prompt down here and save it as a secure string. So I can type in my super secure password down here. And then when I run set DBA login with that new password, it'll actually change the password for that login on the server. So you could wrap this up in some other kind of, uh, with some other code to, to log this to a table and show that we changed the password on this date for this login. So that's how we're managing one. There's no real benefit to that because I could do the same thing in, in Management Studio, right? I could, that wasn't really that much faster than me adding a login, adding the database, checking that checkbox for DB Reader. The power is when we can read in logins from say a CSV or from AD, uh, from Active Directory and create those logins as we go. So in this example, I have a CSV with three logins, I have the passwords in plain text, which is not what you would do in production, but for this test environment, it's fine. I've given it the MS SQL, the SQL instance, the database, and then the roles I wanna give it. Now in this case, I've given it two roles. I wanna give them DB data reader and DB data writer. So I can use PowerShell to pass this CSV file and create these logins with the appropriate access on the server. So now I'm using PowerShell for syntax. So if you're using an older version of PowerShell, you want to use this code down here that uses the for each loop. Uh, I'm using the for each method to basically loop over this array, or sorry, loop over this CSV, import CSV to get it into a PowerShell object. And then for each one, connect to the SQL instance. So connect DBA instance, run new DBA login for that login. And here's where I'm grabbing the username from the for each. And the password is right here, PS item password. So we're getting the password appropriate for that user, creating the login. New DBA DB user for the database that was specified and then adding the DBA DB role member. Since I, some of those roles had multiples, I can use this split function to basically split the role that was passed in. Whenever there's a comma, split that and add multiple roles. So in this example, if I run this, PowerShell will loop through and do all those actions, and it's already created all of the logins that I requested. If I come into security logins, you can see they're all in here. And if I check which one got multiple logins, uh, GL had multiple roles. If I open this guy, where did that box pop up? On the other window, here we go. You can see that the user mapping for database admin, and she has both uh, reader and writer roles in here. So it split that, uh, that value that was passed in and assigned both those roles. So this is one way of using PowerShell and DBA tools to kind of automate tasks that you probably have to do quite often, right? If you have new employees that start once a month, you could have some kind of load that grabs them from Active Directory and assigns them the permissions based on role or something that they needed. So that is DBA tools managing logins. Any questions on that one? So we had one question popping up, um, coming back to backups, um, okay. just to clarify, um, is test backup um, actually restoring um, a backup on the target server? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's taking that, uh, it's 
It's getting the backup history from the first instance and then taking those backup files and restoring them to the second instance and then running check DB, check DB against it on the second instance. So okay. yes, it, it actually verifies that you can restore that, that file to a, a database. Cool. Other than that, I see no questions. So um, let's keep moving. Cool. Good question. Thank you. All right. So life hack number four is uh, masking sensitive data. So this is becoming more and more valuable in today's world, right? We're having to uh, adhere to different regulations and different security practices to make sure we keep our data safe. Uh, so this is going to show you how to find potentially sensitive data within your database. We'll then check out some randomized functions that we have available through DBA tools. We'll create a masking config and then we'll actually mask the data that's in our database. So first things first, let me show you what we're working with. Uh, okay, let me get rid of that. This is the data masking. Uh, it's just a notebook that I have. I'm looking at the AdventureWorks database that we've already looked at on MS SQL 1. And I'm just going to select a top 10 from Human Resources Employee. So you can see this is pretty sensitive data, right? I've got national ID number, which is probably a social security number or, or something PII related. I've got a login. I've got a job title and a birth date. This, is, this could be some pretty sensitive information that our chief executive officer probably doesn't want to spread about in our non-production environment. So we're going to take a look at how we can mask this data in non-production. And this is going to actually change the data. So we'll want to restore our database to non-prod and then mask the data. Otherwise, you will actually have masked your production data, which keeps it secure, but probably not what you want to do. So first of all, we can use this invoke DBA DB PII scan to kind of look at our table and see what it thinks might be uh, sensitive. So I've passed in the SQL instance, my database of AdventureWorks, and my table of employee. And I'm using our grid view to uh, pop up this grid, which is on the wrong window. Here we go. And it's going to scan the table and look for some, idea, uh, for some data that it thinks might be sensitive. So if we come in here, you can see it was the human resources employee table, and it's found these four columns that it thinks might be sensitive, and then it's categorized them for you. So national ID number, it thinks it's probably personal national ID number. Login ID, it thinks it's credentials. We have gender, and we have roguewood, which I'm not sure why it pops up. And every time I give this presentation, I think I should go back and look at why it thinks roguewood is sensitive. But for now, it's uh, showing up in these results. So this is a good way of scanning your data. Obviously, the better way is to talk to the people who own the data and, and understand what's in there, because they might also have things uh, in different columns that should be masked. So, but this is a good way of, of taking a quick look and seeing what's available, what's in there. So DBA tools, uh, these masking commands are an excellent set of commands, and they are really powerful. Um, Sanda, one of the DBA tools contributors wrote these, and he based them on the bogus DLL, which has all of these types of data available within it, which is, is then exposed through DBA tools for you to use. So if we take a look at get DBA randomized type, and I have to actually paste it, you can see that these types are available. These types of data are, are available for us to use to generate actual data rather than just obfuscating letters and numbers into random strings. So if I take a look at, say, the person, and I look at randomized type of person, and I look at the subtype information for that, these are the subtypes of data for people. So we could have gender, we could have last name, we could have phone numbers or emails. That's the kind of data that we can generate using this tool uh, to mask our current data. So if I know, uh, if I know there's a type of data I want, I can also use this pattern uh, parameter to say find the things that are like credit. So credit card number or credit card CVVs are available. Or if there's names, perhaps I need last name or job type, uh, job title or a first name, a domain name. All of these have name in the type. So if we're just looking for that kind of data to, to replace. We can then actually generate data using this library with DBA tools using get DBA randomized value. So I could give it a data type of int and say, give me a random int that's at least 10,000 and it's generated this number. Or I could say, okay, give me a random name, first name and the locale of US for my US customer base and it's given me Vicky 
And if I keep running this, it will give me different names over and over again that I can use. It also has the format parameter. So if I'm asking for a zip code, you can see here, it's giving me the five digit zip code plus the four digit extension, which is, is common in US, uh, in the US that they could either use the five digit, digit zip code or they could request that extension. Well, in this case, I only wanted five digits. So I can actually apply this format so that every time I run it, I will only get that five digits. If I kept running it without the pattern on, it could give me the five digits or it could give me the extension also. So there are a lot of different uh, ways that you can generate data and use this. We're gonna use it to mask current data, but you can also use it to generate a data set if you need. So new DBA DB masking config. This is how we're gonna actually generate a masking config file that we'll use to apply to our database. And it's gonna create just a JSON file. So I'm giving it my SQL instance, my database name, my table, and then these four columns that I want to mask and the path of where this JSON file should go. So if I pass it in here, it should show up when I press enter. And it's created this JSON file. If we take a quick look at it, it tells you what type of file it is. And then it takes you into the table. So this human resources employee table, and then each column. Now it's generated this file by scanning your data and trying to determine what kind of data it is. So national ID number, it thinks is just a random uh, eight to 15 a number between eight and 15, which isn't really very appropriate. And then login ID, it thinks it's an internet username. For job title, it is gonna make a random string out of these characters. It, it did not determine that that was job title at all. For birthday, it worked out it was a date and it was in the past. So it is gonna, when we run this masking uh, config file, when we use this, it will generate random dates in the past for this column. So this is pretty good, right? I could run this and my data would be uh, obfuscated in places and replaced in other places with data. But what I really wanna do is make it more appropriate for my application. So I can modify this file and I've got one here that I already modified and I can make it more appropriate to my data. So my national ID number, it should be at least nine characters and it should be uh, just a random string of these numbers, right? Give me nine random numbers. For login ID, this is what's called a composite uh, masking column. Oops. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a random first name, but then I'm gonna also start with AdventureWorks slash. This is JSON, so I have to escape it. So it's gonna do AdventureWorks slash and then my random first name to create that login ID. If we look at the data, you can see that's pretty much how it is. Then for birthday, I, I'm sticking with a date in the past, but I'm giving it a min and max value. So somewhere between 1950 and 2000 for this date. And then for job title, there is actually a masking type of name and a subtype of job title, so I can generate random job titles to use. So once I've modified this file, I can use test DBA DB masking config to check that the file is still valid JSON. And if nothing is returned, I'm in, I'm in good shape. When I did this demo a few weeks ago when I was practicing, I got these alerts that the column, it, didn't, it no longer met the required properties for the JSON as they'd updated some things. Uh, and I needed to add uh, this keep null column. So my masking file is ready to go. I'm in non-production. I'm gonna actually change the data in the MS SQL 1 AdventureWorks database using this masking file. And if I run this, it's gonna actually update all of the values in that table for, uh, to meet the, the masking config that I basically defined in that file. So it took about eight seconds to update 290 rows. And if I go back to my database and I check this out, you can see that things have changed, right? My login ID for row one was Ken, it's now Jarrell. And my CEO is now a senior usability expert executive with a new birth date of 1986. So this is a way that we have still have usable data. It still looks like it did previously, but it no longer has that sensitive data in. We don't have people's uh, actual title. We don't have their actual national ID numbers anymore. Uh, and their birth dates have been changed. Now, obviously you could go further and you could change other columns uh, in, this, in this database. You could define it as, as detailed as you wanted, and you could define multiple tables within your database too within that file. 
Uh, but this is how we can mask a table with DBA tools to remove any sensitive data from it. Any question on data masking? Yeah, I'm not sure I follow that. Um, the CEO should be in charge of usability, but that's probably for another discussion. Um, but we have a couple of questions um, from the audience. Um, first of all, one is coming back to the logins, actually. Um, how do you sync logins when you're using always on? That's a great question. And I'm not sure there's been a perfect answer for that right now. Um, with DBA tools, you can create logins on multiple instances at once. So when you do new DBA, you, uh, new DBA login or new DBA DB user, you could pass in both the, uh, I guess it would just be for login, but you could pass in both instances and create that login on both at once. Uh, as far as syncing them, you'd have to write some process that copied them backwards and forwards. But if you use copy DBA login, and we'll look at that in a second, uh, actually in this migration section, it will keep the SIDs in, in line with each other. So they will be, uh, they won't get orphaned, if that makes sense. All right. Um, we got two more questions on backup. Um, okay. Why would I use test backup instead of restore data, uh, uh, instead of your restore database? Uh, you could use restore DBA database if you wanted to uh, basically roll your own backup testing. The test DBA last backup is doing the whole process of restore the database, run check DB, uh, drop the database. So you, you, would, you, could have, you could do it yourself with the three commands separately or you can use test DBA backup and it will do it all for you. All right, cool. Um, and when I'm restoring a full backup, um, or when I'm restoring a database using DBA tools and that um, backup database will have a full backup and a couple of differential backups and a couple of log backups, will DBA tools automatically pick up my last full backup and plus my last um, differential plus um, all the um, log backups that came after it? Yes, it will. So it will try and get to the latest point in time that it can. It uses the... Uh, restore backup header to read those files and create the LSN chain that gets you to the latest point in time. And then that's what it will test restore. All right. And then we got two more questions on data masking. So okay. um, Jay is asking about masking a social security number. So um, what he's looking for is um, three random digits, then three zeros, three other random digits. Would that be another use case for a composite? Or how uh, you, you could use com that uh, composite or you could use this format. I believe if you uh, if you formatted this for social security number with your uh, hash for the number and then the dashes, if you pass that into the uh, randomizer for a string of numbers, you would get the format correctly for a social security. Okay. And is, are those masking updates very efficient for very large tables? Great question. So uh, they were not very efficient at all until recently and Sander put in a pretty big update, I wanna say like four or five versions ago now, so still pretty new, where he uh, was working on performance for updating larger tables. Uh, so I have not personally uh, used it on a sizable data set since that update, but yes, there's uh, performance improvements in the recent versions. Thank you, Sander. All Agreed. Right. <laughs> um, that's it for now for questions, so back to you. Thank okay. You. Perfect. So we are moving on to database migration. Uh, so this is really what DBA tools was built for. If you remember, Chrissy was using it to migrate SharePoint instances. So this is where there is a lot of power in DBA tools. Uh, so we'll look at what we can copy around. We'll move some databases and logins, and then we'll upgrade our databases, switching them from a 2017 version of SQL to a 2019 uh, instance. Uh, there is a link in these notes to a DBA tools blog post that I wrote along these same lines of basically I was uh, migrating a ton of application databases and I had this process pretty pretty well down and, and documented on that blog post. So if you want to check that out, it's a DBA tools uh, blog. So first of all, we can use get dash command and look at the verb copy to see all of the copy commands that are available within DBA tools. So you can see we have uh, copy DBA database, we have copy DBA login, we can also copy link servers, triggers, uh, instance audits, table data, database mail settings. There are plenty of things to look through and see all of the available uh, objects that can be moved from one instance to another. For now, we're gonna look at databases and logins because those are the most common that I found uh, need to be moved around. So first of all, I can use get DBA database to get database information from an instance. So I am going to pass in 
uh, my MS SQL 1 instance, I'm going to exclude system databases and I'm using out variable again to save these databases uh, to the DB's variable. I've selected a few properties down here to, uh, to view and then I've used format table to put it in this format. But basically I have those two databases that we've already seen. They're in the normal status. Uh, they're in full recovery mode. The owner is SA and this is the compatibility version. So that information was just saved to the DB's variable that I can use later on. Uh, I'm also going to take a look at logins. So I can use get DBA login to investigate the logins on my MS SQL 1 instance. You can see here's the JSP instance that I added and some of the other ones, Jane and Bob. Uh, I did not save that to a variable as I'm just going to move the JSP login for now. I can also then look at get DBA process. So I'm ready to move my databases and logins, I know what I'm moving. The application has been taken down gracefully, hopefully. So I can now check get DBA process and make sure that no one else is connected. And you can see that someone has connected using it, uh, the SA password through Azure Data Studio. So using that same information from this uh, splat, from this hash table that I built with the SQL instance of the database, I can use get DBA process and I can pass it to stop DBA process. Now that what that'll do it, as it will just kill those processes, okay? So you probably want to make sure that your application is actually down and whoever was connected didn't actually need to be connected, but I'm during my maintenance window, I know that I'm ready to go. I'm going to kill those off and make sure my database is no longer being used. So now I'm in a good state to move my database. So I'm going to use copy DBA database for this. And these are all of the parameters I'm going to pass in. My source of MS SQL 1. My destination is MS SQL 2. My database names, this is the DB's variable that I, that I got the information from before. And I'm specifying the name property of that uh, object. I'm going to use the backup restore method. Uh, this da these databases are pretty small, so what it's going to do is back up to a shared path, which is this next parameter, and then restore from that shared path. So the important thing here is that both instance accounts have permissions to that, to that path. Uh, there is other methods available if you're using larger databases like log shipping. Uh, you don't have to use the backup restore method, just in this example we are. Again, I've turned the verbose switch on so we can see what's happening. And if I start this off, you'll see things are starting to roll by. It's going to back up this database to that shared path, and it's actually striping it across three backup files. Uh, that's the default. You can change that if you want to use one file or if you want to use more files, uh, but this is during testing what was determined to be the most efficient. So it backed up to three files and then it restored from that shared path to the second instance. Once it's done that, it's moved on to my database admin database and it's doing the same. Back it up to the shared path, restore from the shared path to the new instance. And you can see once it's got through all of those things, the databases have been successfully moved. And I'll prove that by showing you my MS SQL 2 instance. I guess I could have shown you before that there were no databases here, but now I have two databases. So then I also want to migrate the, the login. So I can use copy DBA login for this. Same kind of parameters, source, MS SQL 1, destination, and I'm just moving the JSP login, although I could move, uh, I could move AD groups, I could move AD users, I could move S, uh, SQL login. So copy DBA login. I'll pass that in and what it is doing is scripting out the login and then recreating it on the second instance. The password will be the same, the SID will be the same, we won't have any orphaned logins using this method. And it will have the same permissions to the databases that are there as it did on the previous instance. So I had a uh, DB owner on database admin say I will have that permission on my second instance once I've migrated them. Now my databases and logins are on my second instance. I can go ahead and use set DBA, DBA DB state to just set the first instance, the MS SQL 1 databases to offline. Uh, I'm using the fourth parameter, basically saying if there are open connections to kill them and then to set it offline for both these databases. If we check out this guy and refresh, you can see the MS SQL 1 databases are now offline. All right, so I moved my databases from a 2017 instance to a 2019 instance. So if I check them out on MS SQL 2, you'll see that the compatibility level for those two I just moved is 140, whereas the system databases are at 150. I can add 
properties to my splat hash table. So I'm adding the database name of database admin and the target compatibility. And then if I run set DBA DB compatibility with that, it'll actually update the compatibility level of that database admin database. Now, as I mentioned previously, one of the benefits of using DBA tools over your own rolled commands is you get to use other people's knowledge. So in this example, there's a blog post from Tom LaRock about upgrading to SQL Server 2014 and, and a dozen things you should check. Someone has taken all of the knowledge from that blog post and written invoke DBA DB upgrade. And if I run that against the database admin database, it'll go through and check all of these things that we should do when we upgrade a database without us having to even know or think about it too much. I mean, you should definitely think about it if you're doing this in production, but this is using knowledge that you don't have uh, to make you better, right? So it is gonna upgrade the compatibility level. It is gonna run check DB with data purity to make sure our column values are still in range after the upgrade. Uh, DBCC update usage, it's gonna update our set, and then it's gonna refresh all of our user views. You can see the output here was that it was all successful. So this database has been successfully upgraded. Uh, we can turn our application back on, hopefully repoint DNS instead of having to make any connect connection string changes. Uh, but this was upgrading, uh, this was migrating and upgrading our databases from a 2017 instance to a 2019 instance using DBA tools. Any questions on migrations? Yes. I've used this so many times and it has been so valuable. This is a great, great session, section. So All right, go ahead. Let's assume I'm migrating multiple databases and this question is from Mike. Um, is there a way to do that in parallel or would it do one mm -hmm. by one serial? Because obviously if you have a bunch of big databases, this could take a while. If you have a bunch of big databases, uh, I would probably look at the log shipping options to get it ready and, and then cut over at one time so you have a minimal downtime. Uh -huh. uh, you could use like invoke parallel, uh, which I believe Rambling Cookie Monster wrote and is out on GitHub to split and go parallel, but you would kind of have to control it yourself. I don't believe there is a way of automatically uh, having it go parallel, no. All right. Cool. So that will be cool. There we go. Um, if only we knew somebody who would be able to contribute to that thing and add it as a feature. Just <laughs> thinking out loud there. Yeah, just thinking out loud. <laughs> um, other than that, I do not see any questions at this point. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. I don't see anything about parallel in the help, but good question. All right. So. Uh, best practices. This section we're going to look at the test functions available in DBA tools. I'm going to show you how to make sure you're patched to a reasonable level and then we'll check a few other things and then we'll talk about how you can check everything. So if I use the verb of test to look at the DBA tools commands you can see that we have all of these things that we can check and basically with the test commands you're going to say am I in this state? And I don't necessarily know the state that I'm asking about. The command is set up to use best practices where possible. So DBA compatibility, it will check and make sure my compatibility level of my databases matches that of my server. For DB owner, it's going to check whether my DB owner is SA by default. Now you can change that. You can control it and say, I actually want to check that my DB owner is this SQL login, for example. So the first one we're going to check is test DBA build. So I'm gonna pass in both my SQL instances and I'm gonna say test DBA build, latest, and then I'm just formatting it as a table. What this is gonna do is it's gonna check uh, the JSON file that's delivered with DBA tools with all of the versions and see whether my build is, in, uh, is within the, is the latest build. So this is the build of my, uh, of my SQL version and this is the target build or the latest build for that version right now. And you can see that neither of my instances are the latest. Well, that's okay, right? I don't always want to be cutting edge, but I can also pass in this max behind parameter and say I want to be within at least 10 CUs, so 10 cumulative updates. You can also say I want to be within one SP if you're in an older version. And you can see uh, that my one of my instances is within 10 CUs, but one of them is not. It's way behind. Uh, so you can see which instances are within that, uh, within that requirement and where I would need to patch them. 
the JSON file that is used for this is also used to create this really great uh, website, which is kept up to date because DBA tools is kept up to date. And if you go to dbatools.io slash build, you can see all of the data about the versions here and you can filter it out. Maybe you want to look at 2000 versions and see the service packs available. This is a really great reference tool. I can also pipe in my instances to test DBA build and get the same information. I'm going to skip that for now. Then I can test my compatibility level. So test DBA DB compatibility. I'm passing in my instances and then I'm selecting some properties. If I run that, you can see that it's saying now true or false as to whether my version matches. So does the version of my database match that of my server? You can see the database admin one we updated. The AdventureWorks database we did not. So it does not currently meet that test. We can also test the owner. As I mentioned, it's by default testing if it's SA. You can see all of these are, are matching so they show back as true. You can also test the recovery model. Uh, so this is checking to make sure that if I say I'm in full recovery, that I've taken that first full backup and I'm not in pseudo simple or simple mode. Uh, so you can see some of my databases, I say they're in full recovery, but they actually haven't had a backup taken. So they are either in simple or these two are actually offline on MS SQL 1 now. I can also use uh, test DBA temp DB config. Now this is taking everything we know uh, from the community about TempDB best practices and testing to see if I match, if I meet those. It's going to make sure my data files are of equal size. It's going to make sure I set the max size. The files don't exist on the C drive because that's not recommended. It's going to recommend that I have the uh, same number of files as cores up to eight. And it's going to check this trace flag and a couple of other things. So with this, I can use the knowledge from the community through this command to check my instances. And while I'm doing it, I'm learning more, right? I know that now I should set these settings and I can go and learn about, learn about it, find out why. Same thing for max stop. So test DBA max stop. Ah, someone has written this really great calculator and someone has taken the logic from the calculator and put it into this command. Ah, and you can see that for my instance level, my current instance max stop is zero and it's recommending it. I set it to three. There's a similar command for tech, test DBA max memory. Uh, Jonathan Cahayas wrote a really great blog post on that that's super complicated. But if you run this command against your instance, it'll do those calculations for you, uh, tell you how much memory you have on your box, the max value that is set currently and what it recommends. So all of these test functions and many more are wrapped up into the DBA checks module, which I recommend checking out. I've put the link here. Uh, that in itself could be an entire session. And there was some amazing uh, releases this weekend. DBA checks 2.0 came out and you can now uh, run those checks and put them straight into a database for a safekeeping. So that is definitely worth checking out. Uh, that's DBA checks. It's part of the same uh, GitHub organization as DBA tools. So that is how we can check that we're meeting best practices. I am going to head on to the final uh, life hack as we're running a little short on time. Uh, and I've saved the best for last, documentation. Who doesn't love documentation? Woohoo! Yeah, I know. Everyone's awake now. All right, so basically, we can use this uh, export DBA instance command to document our entire environment just with that one command. I've passed in my SQL instances a path to export. And in this case, I'm excluding replication uh, because I don't have it installed and it takes a little second to check, it, check, it's in a, uh, to check whether it's even installed. This is great for DR scenarios. Uh, if I know what my server looked like before it crashed, I can more easily rebuild it. Uh, it's also great for monitoring environments for change. So uh, previously at a job, I ran this kind of command every day into a source controlled folder. And if there was any changes, it created a PR or a pull request. And then those changes had to be documented. Why did the setting change? Why has this login been added? That kind of stuff. So while this is running through, I will show you where it's exporting over here. It's creating a file for each thing. So here is my SP configure file for my MS SQL 1 instance. Basically, it's turned advanced options on and then dumped everything that was in there to this file. So I have all of the settings for SP configure. I also have any server roles db mail settings, 
databases. These are the uh, restore scripts that you need to restore your databases. Now I will make a note, if you're using this for DR, you do need those backup files. I mean, DBA tools is pretty magic, but it is not magic enough to know where the backup files are. You need to bring those with you. Uh, it's also got all of our login information. And it's actually scripting out SQL logins with this hashed password. So this file right now contains pretty sensitive information. You obviously need that for DR, but if you're gonna use this for documentation, uh, there is a exclude password parameter that you can look into to keep, uh, keep your passwords safe. It's also got resource governor, any extended event sessions have been scripted out, and any SQL agent uh, schedules, jobs, etc. The final thing I want to show you for this is, as you know, we migrated our databases from, uh, from MS SQL 1 to MS SQL 2. It's important to make sure that our databases are, or our instances are set up as expected so we can use in VS Code, compare active file with the MS SQL 2 instance and it will highlight any changes. So you can see on my MS SQL 1 instance on the left, I had CLR enabled and on my new instance, I don't. So if my application depended on that, I could be in trouble now. There are some other settings that are set up. Uh, I have my agent set up on one instance and not on the other. And then there are some new, new parameters in the 2019 version that were not available in the 2017 version. So this is a great way to just check and make sure that I have things set up as expected on my new box. And also a good way to document everything and keep track of your instances. So that was documentation. Any questions on that? Otherwise, I'm going to quickly finish up with a couple of slides, just because you asked so nicely. <laughs> so uh, first of all, a very disturbing comment from my friend, Leslie Andrews. She says she loves documentation. So that seems to be a cry for help. So Leslie, okay. we, should, we should talk. We'll check uh, in on her. Yeah. I mean, this is what this situation is doing to all of us. This is what's yeah. happening. This is it's turning us to documentation. I mean, seriously, what, what's happening? Um, Jay's got another question. So would you recommend DBA checks over SQL PBM? Is that policy-based management? I would assume so, but okay. I was kind of wondering the same thing. Okay. Yes. If so, I have not really used the policy-based management stuff, um, but I believe it's like on an instance level. With DBA checks, I can pass in my entire estate. I can give it 10 instances. I can give it 100 instances. And then a list of checks I want to check, like check my database status, check my backups have happened within the last seven days, check all these things, and it'll run them against those 10 or 100 instances at once and bring the results back. So I think I would say yes, but I don't have a lot of experience with the PBM stuff. All right, cool. Uh, a couple of people asking, will you and where will be sharing those slides? And I think uh, mm -hmm. the script and I think the slide that we're just seeing is basically answering that yep. question. Yeah, not this version of the slides, but my, uh, I, they're just not, doesn't have the group by theme, but the same information is available on my GitHub. All of the demos are on there, and my demo environment is actually built on two Docker containers, and the Docker build file is up there too, so. Okay, and then there is one more question. Is there a way to determine what product of the, what version of the source products will be installed before actually installing? What version of the source product, as in the DBA tools module? Jay, could you just clarify that? If that is the question, you can use find module DBA tools and it will go out to the gallery and see what the latest version is. And then if you do nothing but install dash module DBA tools, it will install the latest module. Uh, you can specify a minimum version. I think you can specify a specific version with required version. Uh, but by default, it will install the latest. Yeah. Um, so Jay, um, yeah, maybe you can just reach out to Jess after that. Um, so we can give Jess the time to finish on slides. Um, other than Perfect. that, we had no questions, but a bunch of comments along the lines of great session and you rock. Um, I agree, awesome. I concur, so. Um, Perfect, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so last couple of slides. I have this uh, list of resources. There's a couple of blog posts on DBA tools that I would recommend. Uh, the first one is a link to more information about the Meet, the book, uh, DBA tools in a month of lunches. And the second one, that secure link, uh, that is a really great blog post on why DBA tools is secure and why it's enterprise ready. Uh, if you need to take something to your security team or to your managers and be like, I want to use DBA tools, 
take that blog post because it has everything laid out and it's really great. <clears throat> Under docs, I have uh, docs.dbatools.io. That is a website version of all of the comment-based help within the functions from DBA tools. So all of the examples, all the parameters, everything is up on that website and it's easily searchable. That's a great resource. Uh, the build link there, dbatools.io slash build is the build reference that I brought up in the demo. It shows all of the SQL versions, uh, service packs, cumulative updates, uh, version numbers there. Then on the right hand side, I have how you can get in contact with the DBA tools team, the GitHub repo. Uh, they're really active on Slack. Like I think some maybe don't sleep. Uh, so you can always find DBA tools folks on there if you need to chat and on Twitter at PSDBA tools. Uh, give them a shout out, tell them, tell them you love DBA tools or ask any questions and people pick those up and get back to you. So uh, these resources, as I mentioned, are up on that GitHub repo. If you didn't have a chance to not jot them down. Finally, any final questions, I'm happy to answer them. This is my contact information again. Uh, tweet at me, email me. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And thanks awesome. for coming.